Hey, does this thing work? Mm. Yeah. Well, that sorted it. Okay, does art have value? Considering where we are, I think I can make the assumption most of you think it does. But I still think it's worth talking about anyway. So much art value is subjective. So, Imagine for a moment you're walking past the window and you see these two clocks. You might wonder if the business inside has closed down until you realise it's an art auction house. And the clocks are up for sale with a guide price of £6 million. A perfectly natural re reaction would be to go, What the fucking hell? <laughs> and as far as the price goes, I agree. But, the piece itself, untitled, Perfect Lovers, is by a guy called Felix Gonzalez Torres and was made shortly after his partner, Ross Laycock, who was diagnosed with AIDS. The clocks represent the two lovers and start in sync, but slowly go out of sync with time, as time and disease take their toll. So, having made the case that even conceptual art has value. Let's talk a bit about the culture wars. I know, I'm sorry, but I do have a point to make. So Plato, because he thought he lived in some sort of ancient Greek version of the Matrix, with, you know, minus the trans allegory and um, the fun action bits, came to the conclusion that art had no place in his perfect society. This line of thought, thankfully, didn't last long past his death. But he also invented Atlantis. And that has empowered far too many racist cranks who discount human ingenuity, including the villains of this next story. So, fuck Plato. <laughs> In January of 1919, Hans Prinzhorn, at the age of 32, walked into the asylum at Heidelberg University. Hans is an interesting character. By this point in his life, he had rejected the role in the family business, going on instead to pursue cultural interests at some of Germany's best universities. He was taught by, amongst others, the celebrated art historian August Schmarsau and Theodor Lips a philosopher of aesthetics whose work provided a bridge between philosophy and psychology. His studies ended at Munich, which at the time was one of the centres of the European avant-garde, and Hans was thrived in that atmosphere. After completing his PhD in 1908, he started training to become a professional baritone in Leipzig. It was during his time at the Conservatoire that he encountered serious mental illness for the first time. After the suicide of her fiancé, one of Hans's fellow students, Erna Hoffman, had to be hospitalised. Over the next two years, Hans spent a lot of time trying to help Erna, and having left his first wife, married her in 1912. Then Erna had a relapse, leading Hans to give up on his dreams of being a professional singer and went on to study to become a doctor. When World War I came along, Hans was conscripted as a medic. It was during his military service that he met his future boss at Heidelberg Asylum, Carl Billmans, who was fascinated by a small collection of patient art at the asylum and was looking for ways to utilise it. Carl's initial idea was to give individual cases to researchers to the end of gaining some sort of diagnostic conclusion from the artwork. However, the selection of art at Heidelberg was far too small for this purpose. So Carl tasked Hans with asking other institutions, mainly Austria and Germany, but also from as far away as in Japan, if they had any art that they could use in their studies. In the end, about 20,000 works were collected and catalogued. 
However, using art as a diagnostic tool didn't really interest Hans. Because of his background in art history, his interest was in the patient, in the patient's work, lay in the aesthetic and the philosophic, with works like The Choking Angel by Franz Bühler, a schizophrenic metal worker from Hamburg, which as can be seen is an intense rendering of a cold, divine, menacing divine menace crushing their victim's throat underfoot. Prinzhorn didn't hesitate to compare the work to that of Albrecht Dürer. Another inmate artist, the seamstress Agnes Richter, produced a subversive version of her institutional uniform by restitching the arms on backwards and embroidering it all over with expressions of her plight. I'm not big. I miss today. You do not have to. Intriguing too was a former builder called Karl Genzel, who produced wooden effigies that drew simultaneously on the ancestor art of New Guinea and the scurrilous language of political cartooning. Faced with material like this, Hans wrote and found a publisher for his book Artistry and the Mentally Ill. None of the art in this book would comfort the soul. But if you look at the art being created around the time of the artist in the book, you'll find the likes of Edvard Munch, Egon Schiele, and Ben Hoch. None of whom made artists that were art that was particularly comforting, but instead art that expressed the pain and anxiety of the world as they saw it. But if art was ever meant to comfort us, can somebody please explain how the fuck watching Titus Andronicus is a comforting experience? Let alone the, the various Jacobean revenge tragedies or the paintings of Goya and Hieronymus Foch, and many others through history. Which is to say that art, dark currents have always been present in the arts, but these things have been ex the way these things have been expressed vary as we work on new ways to express old emotions. Paul Clay was a big fan, and he used it in his classes that he taught at the Bauhaus, as well as being strongly influenced in his own work. Max Ernst took the book with him when he was smuggled into France in 1922, and like Clay, his artwork was directly influenced by it, and so was Salvador Dali, and many others. Unfortunately, during this brief period in Germany in the 1920s and 30s, where art inspired by insanity stood at the forefront of the avant-garde, there was another form of madness calling through its way through German society, led by the noted chaplain moustache fetishist Adolf Hitler. With his national socialist delusions of a mythical past ruled by a pure Aryan bulk, this along with his view of himself as a cultured man, who believed that he had both the vision to conjure his nation's path and the will to send the people along it, no matter what the body count. He presented his politics as a cultural enterprise, and saw modern art with its borrowings from psychiatry, its abstractions and its raw emotional power, as a symptom of the insane malaise that had polluted the community of ethnic Germans. Volk's mind shot. True Aryan art, he believed, was make the German spirit visible. And the spirit and this spirit would recover only when entartum or degeneracy had been eradicated. The cultural war would prove to be a precursor to racial cleansing. I don't have time to go into this in nearly the detail it deserves. So a couple of examples will have to suffice. In Thuringia, the Nazis indulged in their first act of cultural cleansing on April the 5th of 1930. Wilhelm Frick signed the first piece of National Socialist cultural legislation. The decree, Vida der Neger Kultur für das Deutsche Volkstum, or Against Negro Culture for German Tradition, found that public authorities would do their utmost to preserve, promote, and strengthen German art. 
certain types of music were banned, including jazz, along with books by Eric Maria Remark, and the films of Eisenstein, Pabst, and Podolkin. The Bauhaus had been forced out of Weimar by right-wing politicians in 1925, and when Frick appointed Schultz and Naumburg to lead the United Art School, which now occupied the Bauhaus's old building. The architect fired most of the school staff before ordering the destruction of all remaining paintings, wall reliefs, and frescoes left by the Bauhaus artists. That November, Frick and his cultural advisor ordered the first Nazi art purge at the Weimar Schloss Museum, instructing staff to remove every modernist painting Around 70 works were taken off the walls, including pieces by Kandinsky, Clay, Kokoschka, Barlack, Dix, Kollwitz, Munk, Nolder, Schlemmer, schmidt rothler and even the dead German war hero, Franz Marc. Now, after the Nazis had taken over the German state and finished their evolution from an organization of dangerous cranks to some of the worst people to hold power in history, they continued their program of moulding German culture into an approximation of their viewpoint. And they valued art, just as long as it's the right art. In 1937, they created an exhibition made up of a selection of the 16,000 pieces of art that they had removed from German museums and public collections in a systematic purge. This selection became known as the Degenerate Art Exhibition, which included some of the works uncovered by Hans Prinzhorn. The central thesis of the exhibit was you had to be mad to produce art like this, and the people who bought it for the German people were hateful traitors who squandered the public purse. You may notice this dangerous degenerate art was not hidden away to keep people safe from it, Far from it, it was put on display to make the good Germans angry. The exhibition toured for four years and had millions of visitors. A lot of the art seized from the museums was destroyed. Some of it was sold or swapped for more ideologically sound works from abroad. In 1939, Actium T4 was enacted. And letters were sent to every asylum in Germany, asking the doctors there to answer a few questions about each of their patients. These forms were then sent to a pa panel of ardent Nazi psychiatrists, who with next to nothing in the way of medical information, set about determining who was to die and who was just to be sterilized instead. Then tens of thousands of the mentally and physically disabled were rounded up and taken to facilities where they would eventually be herded into airtight rooms. The doors were then shut and carbon monoxide was pumped in. When this was over, the corpses were removed and cremated. By the end of 1940, over 20% of psychiatric inpatients of Germany and Austria had been reduced to ash including at least 30 of the artists that Hans Prinzhorn had found. Amazingly, their artworks survived and can be found at the Samuel Prinzhorn in Heidelberg, which opened in 2001. Hans himself had died of typhus back in 1933, after damaging his reputation with three opinion pieces praising the Nazis and a fourth, mildly condemning them. All had been written for Der Ring, which was a night bright wing newspaper. Now for a look at some more recent cultural warriors, starting with the late and very unlamented Senator from North Carolina, Jesse Helms, who mobilised angry demonstrations against the works of Robert Mapplethorpe. I honestly don't know if he's more offended by the queer or the interracial <laughs> aspect of this photograph, but the most telling element of his attitude to Mapplethorpe was that when an exhibition had been cancelled in 
Washington DC on concerns of safety, he sent one of his staff members to phone up and ask that it be put back on again. He didn't want people to not see the artwork. He wasn't worried about it. He just wanted people's hate. This sort of rhetoric is alive and unfortunately well today on the internet, with the likes of Prager U and Paul Joseph Watson saying things used to be better before abstraction was a thing, and Tories are the new punk, and lots of other nonsense. While in parts of the British press you will find opinion pieces complaining about con woke contemporary art or galleries, or that galleries have added historical context to pieces of art that are set with things like slavery. Again, most of the time they're not really talking about the art. So, what can artists do about authoritarian weirdos like this? Honestly, unfortunately, I think not an awful lot. Art's never going to change the world. How could it? But then again, why would you even think that art is even for changing the world? I'm not saying that it doesn't affect society. Obviously it does, but systemic change is beyond the scope of any piece of art, artist, or this talk. So, enough of that. What non-destructive values does art have? Well, lots. And they're occasionally surprising, at least to me. To start with, let's go back to Felix and his perfect lovers. When I was in the research stage of this talk, I had this image up on my PC and my partner walked in and understanding it to be a piece of art, expressed that they thought it was a beautiful way to express the various dysfunctional interactions between mental and physical health. I have to say, I like the take. Probably far from anything the artist intended, but Lauren found herself moved to say what they thought without second guessing herself, which is very unusual for her. Because, like many of us, they don't like feeling that they've made a fool of themselves. But she's right, things have changed a lot since 1989. And work can't be limited to the artist's intent, or it'll become meaningless and die. Which is interesting that artistic intent doesn't matter. It absolutely does. But it can be a tricky thing to pin down, as it frequently changes through the process of making the piece, or can be as nebulous as, I like blue, let's make a movie about that. So, speaking as someone who makes things to be seen, much more important than inspiration or intent is just getting on and making something for whatever reason. So ideas are easy, but doing is difficult, but possible, as long as you reject the perfect and are prepared to fail, and there is nothing like art to teach you failure. Reflecting on the mistakes you've made is how a project progresses towards the point when you feel like you might want to let other people see it. Now, as a consumer of art and culture, I feel that there are objectively only three types of art. They're the art that you like, the art that you dislike, and the art that you're generally indifferent to. Now, the quick-witted amongst you will have noted that each which category of work of, a work of art goes into is based entirely on the subjective experience of the individual viewer. And depending, that categorization will change depending on their mood or people that they're with, or any number of other things. No, you don't. Anyway, I didn't say that this was a useful way of looking at art. Just an objective one. <laughs> I don't have time to go into the value of art's criticism, other than to say, as well as being a valid art form in and out of itself, it can add historical context and create theoretical frameworks with rules that are just aching to be broken by anyone who cares to do so. And as for you lot, of course I answered back. You're just a slightly exaggerated, hopefully funny, framing device to show the parts of me that get in the way of my creativity. 
my imposter syndrome, my bad takes, my creative blocks, and myriad other character flaws. As for you, <laughs> artists can't do much about the culture wars, but audiences can. For starters, don't fall for the bullshit. <laughs> When a newspaper tells you this gallery's art has changed for the worse just because the description changed, that doesn't stop you enjoying the paint, the, the art. It's still the same thing. And just because some loud mouthed idiot on the internet says that all modern art is rubbish, that's not true either. You may not like it, and that's fine, but. And just because I'm on a stage, that doesn't make me a reliable narrator. <laughs> Still, I hope you will take the following advice. When you have the time, energy and inclination, engage with art. And don't let anyone else tell you what to think about it. It's here. Yeah. Just remember that the stuff that you don't like probably means a lot to someone else. So try not to be too unkind in any comments that you make in their hearing. I'll end this with a quote from Emma Goodman, who knew a thing or two about standing up to authoritarians. And if you have any questions, I'll be outside to answer them.